In this video, ED threatens the wrong grandparents. Entitled group of friends expect everyone else to split the bill for their drinking binge and then it gets worse. And force me to take two weeks of unpaid time off? Have fun running the place without me. ED threatens the wrong grandparents. In spite of being full grown and having a family of my own, the scars of growing up with an entitled father still rear their ugly head every once in a while. This particular event was one that, in all likelihood, saved my life. I share it now to pay homage to the beloved grandfather who stood up to my dad. This happened many years ago, but it was monumental enough to stay with me forever. I was home in Texas for a visit as my dad was stationed in Germany. My father didn't accompany us on this visit with my grandparents. After the last visit, he'd wisely learned to steer clear. So, by this point, I was 15 and starting to suffer emotional problems due to the abuse that my dad was heaping on me. I was withdrawn, my hair was starting to fall out, and I had constant panic attacks. My sweet grandparents could see that I wasn't well. I'd been abused pretty much my whole life, and secrecy and denial were embedded in my psyche. When they asked me if my dad had done this or that, my knee-jerk response was to deny, deny, deny. After three weeks, my 16th birthday came around. My mom had agreed to extend our stay long enough for me to be in the States to celebrate. Now, my grandfather had the habit, since I was a young girl, of heading down to a local cafe every morning to have coffee with a group of men from the community. I never thought anything of it, nor did anyone else, but that was his coffee time, end of story. One day, not long before we were due to fly back overseas, my granddad asked me to go to coffee with him. I politely declined. Who wants to go watch a bunch of old men drink coffee at 7 a.m.? He gave me a strange look and told me I was going to go with him the next day. He'd make sure I got up in time. Ugh. Okay, sure, granddad. I got to the cafe and it was exactly what I pictured. About seven old men, some in suits and some in coveralls. Granddad grabbed my elbow and guided me to a table with a well-dressed, imposing-looking man. As soon as we sat down, he looked at me with the kindest eyes I've ever seen from a stranger. We spent about 20 minutes talking, mostly about life in Germany. I went home and thought nothing more about it. My birthday was four days later. Then it was time to start getting ready to go back. My grandfather took me out the next day to get a new pair of shoes, but I was shocked when he pulled up to the courthouse. He turned to me and asked, point blank, if I really wanted to go back. I said I didn't, but really had no choice. He replied, what if it was your choice? I said again that I didn't have a choice. I was terribly frightened of my father's wrath. With that, he opened my car door and guided me into the courthouse. We ended up in an office and a judge walked in, the same man I spoke to at the cafe. I was stunned, but he and my granddad had been friends for years. He said, so, young lady, I understand from your grandfather that you wish to be emancipated. Now, I didn't have the first clue what that word meant, but I knew that if my granddad said I did, I should agree. I nodded, and the two of them started talking a mile a minute. They look at me now and then, and all I did was nod. I knew something big was happening, though I didn't understand what. When we left, Granddad told me not to say a word to anyone, especially not my mom or brother. That night, he asked my mom what she thought of me staying in Texas and starting school there. She, of course, balked at the idea. That night, she called my dad, and he got on the phone with me and told me I'd better not try anything cute. I'd be on that plane, or he'd have me put in a mental hospital. I went in and told my granddad what he'd said, but granddad just smiled and told me to get some sleep. Next morning, I was up at the crack of dawn, and Granddad told me to go get in the car. I remember being so excited and frightened because I knew something was up. In 20 minutes, I was in front of the judge, nodding and saying, yes sir, to everything he said. We walked out and Granddad told me I was going to be very brave and to trust him to tell me what to do. He took me to a little furnished apartment and told me to stay there. Granddad went home and told my mom that I wasn't going anywhere near her or Dad again and handed her paperwork. She freaked out and called Dad, who called and in his most entitled manner told the old man that he didn't know who he was messing with and that if I thought he was just gonna let me walk away from him, he'd make sure I was locked away until she's 30 and I can make it happen. 
Granddad told him if he ever came back to this town, there'd be a group of men with shotguns waiting for him. My mom and brother left the next week. I never said goodbye because my granddad said there was no need to let them back in your head. I was an emancipated minor at the age of 16. At 17, I joined the Air Force. I don't think I'd have lived through two more years with that man. I miss my granddad so much, but I hope he died proud of what he'd done for me and who I became. Entitled group of friends expect everyone else to split the bill for their drinking binge, and then it gets worse. Cast. Me, myself, and I equals me. EF1. Entitled friend number one. EF2. Entitled friend number two. Friend. One of several other friends that were also on the trip. A group of 12 of us friends decided to go out to dinner while on a golf trip we all took to Scottsdale. When we arrived at the restaurant, they weren't ready for us yet and had us go into the bar. Most of us ordered soda. I ordered a green tea while four of them ordered top shelf drinks. A lot of top shelf drinks. I mean, they were downing drinks like they were water. After about 20 minutes, our table was ready and we asked for our bills. Most of you know exactly where this is going. The waitress comes back with one bill and hands it to one of the drinkers who had asked for a single bill. EF1 looks at the bill for a moment, pulls out his phone, types something and then says, EF1. Okay, everyone's share comes to $48 plus tip. Everyone else that wasn't drinking just looked at him. Yes, the four of them ran up over $550 in drinks in under 20 minutes and they expected everyone else to pay for it too. EF2, come on, cough it up. Just the way he said it. Me, yeah, no, I only ordered a green tea. I'm not paying $48 for a green tea. EF1, just pay up. Me, forget it. What was my drink, $5? Friend, Emboldened by my response, I only ordered a Sprite. I'm not paying $48 either. This got the others grumbling too. Now the tables turned on the floor with the other eight of us refusing to split the tab. Cue the alcohol reducing the inhibitions of one of the four to bring out his true self. EF2 turns to me and says, Cheap ass, you should be paying for everyone's drinks anyway. Me, what are you talking about? EF2 you make more than the rest of us, so you should be paying for everything for everyone every time we go out, including this trip. That phrase, everything for everyone every time we go out, really burned me when he said it. Why in the world would anyone think someone else should be paying for everything for everyone? I did make a good living, but that was about it. The kicker is, one of our friends did make huge bank. Everyone knew about it and he was even there with us. EF2, however, had his sights set on me because there was some back jealousies he and his wife had that I won't go into. Me. Screw you. Having the cheapest person I know calling me a cheap ass is just absurd. And I'm not paying $48 for a glass of tea. Most of you won't believe this part, which is fine because it's completely unbelievable. If it didn't happen to me, I wouldn't believe it either. EF2 gets his wife on the phone, don't get me started on that tart, puts her on speakerphone, tells her I won't split everyone's drink bill, and she proceeds to tell me off over speakerphone to everyone in earshot. Now, I don't remember exactly everything she said because it was so ridiculous and I was fuming. I do remember her parroting how I should be paying for everything so they were obviously talking about that sentiment before. Eventually, I dropped this little gem on her. Me. If I wanted a bunch of people to leech off my wallet, I would have a bunch of kids. This was before I had children, if you were curious. You two are also the cheapest people I know, followed by a few examples of just how cheap they were and how they took advantage of friends. EF2's wife. Blazy blazy blazy. I don't remember exactly what she really said, but I do remember it being more drivel and entitled. I did eventually say, me, fuck you, which was totally called for. EF2's wife, don't you cuss at me, me, fuck you. Now this is another part of the story that most people will not believe, which is fine. EF2's wife, don't cuss at me again or I'm gonna hang up. Just imagine the mentality of someone giving this threat in this situation and thinking it would carry any weight. Me, what the? Go ahead and hang up. I didn't call you. Oh, and you know what? Fuck you. I looked at EF2. 
threw down a few bucks on one of the tables and walked towards the waitress. I was done with that whole scene, and so was everyone else. No idea what further conversation went on back there, but most of the other guys came to the table shortly thereafter, except the drinkers, which I'm sure were trying to figure out how to pay their bill. Force me to take two weeks of unpaid time off? Have fun running the place without me. I used to work at this coffee shop, my first chain coffee shop after working only at local or family run ones. Simply put, it was hell. Owners would micromanage everything without knowing anything about how the business ran, never listened to their staff, and only cared about the money. Typical out-of-touch owners of a business. I was hired to replace a manager that had walked out of one of their locations, leaving it with only part-time staff. I was told I was being hired on as the acting manager until they either hired someone else or they felt I would be a good fit for the position after my six-month probation. I won't go into everything that went wrong because there's a lot, but to summarize, it was literal hell. I was expected to cover all no-shows, which had me working 90 to 100 hours a week. I wasn't allowed to fire anyone, no matter how many things they did wrong. Someone actually showed up to work drunk, and I still wasn't allowed to fire them. And any changes I wanted to implement were shot down. Like replacing old parts in the espresso machine, shortening our hours to save money on labor, and bringing in items that customers would always ask for. I was stressed, overworked, and irritated as hell when the owner comes in to talk to me about sales for the store. We weren't making enough to warrant the hours I had scheduled, and he wasn't going to pay me any more overtime. I'd only work the hours I'm scheduled, and if someone no-showed, I'd have to have someone else cover those shifts. I tried to explain to him that I only came in when no one else would cover. It just so happened that the people he allowed to continue to work here had terrible availability. Making the schedule was already hard enough. Getting someone other than myself to come in on their day off was next to impossible. On top of all that, I had to learn the ropes myself. There was no one to train me, so all the managerial knowledge, ordering, scheduling, I learned myself. No one other than me knew how to order coffee, had the numbers for the repair guy, anything other than making coffee and using the till, I was the only one that knew. He wasn't hearing any of it. Owner, all I'm hearing is excuses. This is your store. If you can't handle running it, I'll start looking for someone who will. Me, wasn't that the plan though? It's been three months since my probation period ended and you never gave me the manager position, so I assumed you were looking for someone to take over. Owner, I think it's in your best interest to take some time off. Start thinking about your position here and whether you actually want to start moving up. I had mentioned in the interview I was looking forward to working my way up in the business. Me. I can't. There's no one to cover me. Owner. You're taking this time off. Me. Is this a paid break? Owner. No, consider this a time out for you to get yourself sorted. Take the two weeks to rest and we'll see what your position will be like when you get back. Me. Owner. I can't really afford to take that amount of time off. I can't even take two days without having to come in and cover. Owner, don't worry about the business right now. It'll run without you. Now, to put into perspective, I was basically the manager at that point. I made the schedules, I did the orders, I knew the codes to the safe and the alarm. I wasn't allowed to hire someone to assist me and no one worked enough time to be able to cover even half my shifts. I knew this. The staff knew this. Customers knew it. I made sure to block all work numbers and spent those two weeks looking for another job. I managed to find one after a few days that paid significantly more. I sent my resignation email to payroll and the owner, knowing he never checks it, deleted my account off the POS system, being a manager means I have access to it from home, and spent the rest of the leave catching up on well-deserved sleep, having blocked all work numbers. I'm not getting paid, so I'm not working. According to my coworkers, shit started going wrong the next day. One of the openers didn't show and the next staff member didn't have keys. Owner wasn't answering his phone so they left a message. Owner didn't show up until one of the regulars called asking if the place was closed down. He showed up four hours after they were supposed to open. Orders weren't done. Inventory was missed. Four no-shows, you name it, it went wrong. Owner tried every way he could to get a hold of me, even using a customer's phone to call me. Too bad I didn't answer any calls that weren't in my contacts already. After two weeks, I turned my phone back on and get a call the same day from the owner. We agreed to meet the next day. Owner, so, you've had some time to think. Me, I have. It's really given me perspective on my position here. 
owner. We can start you back on your normal hours for now, and we're looking for a manager to take on some of your responsibilities. Me. Oh, that's good. I'm actually quitting. He was silent for a few minutes. I think he was actually waiting for me to tell him I was kidding. Sucks for you, buddy. I'm serious. Me. I've already emailed payroll and removed my login from the computer. Here are my keys. Good luck. And I left. Owner tried calling me a few times but stopped once I told him to check his email. I was on okay terms with some of the staff that worked there and apparently a majority of them had quit after I had left. Owner did find a replacement pretty quickly but without anyone to train them, owner didn't know anything about running the business. They were messed up from the get go and left pretty soon after they were hired. My petty ass is always checking reviews from customers and employees and they've consistently sucked for the past year and seem to be on a downward trend over the past year.